Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Always 1776, a free site. Let's talk money, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me just say, I'm an immigrant to the United States. Uh, my parents were great people but I was not raised in an investment environment. Right, so I don't recall ever hearing the word entrepreneur before I was in college. People around me, in part because it was the late 70s, early 80s, right, when people had a different attitude. The stock market had been flat for years. People around me didn't really talk about it. And this was in New York City, uh, where I lived. Didn't really talk about stocks, didn't talk about bonds, didn't talk about investments. While people talked about starting their own businesses, they didn't talk about investing in vibrant businesses. No one talked about PE, multiples, anything like that. So, now that I'm in my 50s, and I've had some great times financially. I've also had some not great times financially. They're wins and definitely losses. But let me just say, I'm going to give back. I think a lot of people in their 50s want to give back, want to give advice to younger generations to hopefully empower them, allow them to realize their dreams, uh, allow them to avoid some of the mistakes that folks in their 50s like me have made. So, in an effort to give back, let's talk about what's happening right now economically, globally, right? First, I know there's a lot of division in the United States over left and right, uh, over vaccine mandates and vaccination choices, uh, over whether or not the government should tell people what to put in their bodies, right? The logic is, hey, we all want to be safe. The government knows best. Experts like Dr. Fossey know better than the rest of us. And, of course, those, let me raise my hand in that group, who believe that everyone should make their own choice, that these uh, vaccines are relatively new that there are no real experts in life, right? That Dr. Fossey himself is mortal, has made mistakes in the past, right? That the individual should be empowered to make their own decisions concerning their own bodies. Well, let me point out, the real dispute is not right and left. That's always an illusion to me. Because right now in the United States, what we think of as the right and what we think of as the left are both status, in my opinion. Now, I believe the real dispute, the real conversation should be between those who prefer centralized power, think China, right? Those who prefer centralized power, who buy into the idea that these politicians are special people with special insight and that there are economies of scale, certain levels of efficiency can be hit with centralized planning. And those who prefer decentralized decision making, right? Where the individuals are the sources of creativity, where there is price discovery, you find out what in fact works from finding out what people have decided to gravitate to in the market right put simply this is the ongoing feud between the alexander hamilton centralized crowd and the thomas jefferson decentralized crowd right the folks who want a very strong federal government versus the folks who want states to be able to make many of their own decisions. Now let me just say, I need to have people think about it in that framework because the level 
of centralization creates certain vulnerabilities in the system that we need to look at, right? Systems to me are more fragile, right? To use a phrase that's from Nassim Taleb, they're less robust than decentralized systems. In other words, if the central thesis of a centralized power structure is incorrect, the whole thing crumbles. Now, I want people to look hard in China. I know when I was growing up, if someone came up to me in the hood and started talking about China, I'd be thinking, what does China have to do with me? Right? I'm here in the U.S. Just understand that China right now has everything to do with you. Because China is a centralized authoritarian regime. Right? More importantly, because of the decisions that that regime has made, certain markets are incredibly centralized. Now, full disclosure, I'm a copper investor. I invest in Freeport McMoran. The stock's been great for me, in part because a lot of copper. 20% of the global consumption of copper is done in the Chinese property sector which until now has been on fire and highly valued. Right? Understand, copper had a floor. China was building up their property sector hopelessly overvalued. Right? The consumers there, we'll call it the market culture. Every place has a market culture. <clears throat> Assume that real estate was a great investment. Right? By the way, I have a California state broker's license. Let me just tell you, real estate can go up, real estate can go down. Just food for thought. Well, just to understand, because the copper market was heavily concentrated, right? A fifth of it was consumed by China. Because the steel market had the same level of concentration, again, a fifth of it was consumed by China. Right? Because the Chinese government, because Chinese investors thought greatly about real estate and construction, right? these important global markets had built-in demand for them <clears throat> that led to a premium in their stock prices. Well, just understand, right now things have changed in China. Things have changed greatly. Let's talk about one such change. Before the Great Recession, which didn't happen that long ago, 70% of home buyers in China were first time home buyers. In other words, you had a relatively decentralized market, right? The market had a lot of people participating. Folks were getting into the market, it was a broad assortment of folks. Well, now, today, folks, 85%, 85% of Chinese home buyers already have a home. Many have more than one. So understand, housing has gone from necessity. I need a place to live. I'm a first time home buyer. Let me get a home. To speculation. We got our home already. How can we increase our capital? Let's invest in these other homes. So understand, you have a smaller group making bigger share of the market decisions. Right? You don't have a lot of people owning the home they're in. Now you have a smaller group owning multiple homes. Folks, that kind of situation can only last as long as the smaller group believes in current market conditions.
the minute the markets change, if your house isn't the place you live in, if it's just a speculative investment, many people are going to move their capital. So right now, let's take a hard look at China. We know Evergrande has been having problems. They're in delinquency. We know that Minchang Bank right now has lost something like 50% of its value over the last few months. In other words, some <clears throat> meaningful financial institutions are having significant financial problems paying their bills. Right? You understand. Because the pool of investors is not as widespread as it used to be. The investors who are viewing their real estate investments, at least a portion of them, as speculative, are more prone to end their speculation. Right? In other words, once the P.E ratio starts getting squeezed right people are gonna think to themselves hey I bought in at X the market has dropped by Y this is a speculation this is my third home that I don't need am I gonna wait for this thing to drop further or am I gonna get out the market now because the number of investors have dwindled in the space each investor has a much bigger impact than they did in the past when the market was less concentrated. So I want people to just understand that markets are global. I know in real estate they tell you location, location, location. But if the margins start getting squeezed in China, I'm just telling you other overinflated by historical standards real estate markets take Australia might say to themselves you know what real estate is on a downward trajectory in China maybe I need to sell my third home maybe I need to sell my second home understand you have some Chinese investors who have invested in the Australian <coughs> real estate market if in fact China is having financial problems, and by the way, Evergrande is not the only property company in China now having problems, right? It's spreading. Well, understand those Chinese investors might pull their money from abroad to pay their own financing costs in China. So this is the way problems happen. Right, you hear about collapsing markets someplace far away, in this case China, and you don't realize that it could start a domino effect that leads to where you are, New York City, San Jose, California, or wherever. Right? So let's talk about the great question now facing investors. Right? You've already figured out that the expectations that were built into the copper market right again 20 percent of global consumption took place in the Chinese property sector the steel market again 20 percent of that market um, was consumed by the Chinese property sector you already know that circumstances have changed there you're gonna have less demand for copper and for steel if the Chinese property sector stumbles that means people into Freeport MacMoran like me might have to think about moving their funds or might have to temper our expectations well just understand the situation is deeper than that right now in the United States we have inflation People paying attention at the gas pump are noticing that gas is more expensive than it's been recently. 
Certainly it's much more expensive than it was last year. We're realizing that when they don't raise prices on certain items, they change the item. So that burger at your favorite burger place, you might notice you're getting less meat. You might notice you're getting more of cheaper substitutes, right? More bread on that burger. You go to the supermarket, you might notice that beef prices are through the roof. That steak that you used to buy now costs $5 more. Right? If your local restaurant is still open in this pandemic era and you're at the restaurant, you might notice that the food prices have gone up across the board. This is even with fewer people in the restaurant. So the big question for investors is what comes next? Do we get more inflation? Or do we get deflation? Let's talk about both arguments. Now the inflation argument, I would encourage people to Google Michael Burry. Right? He made a mint shorting the American real estate market a few years ago. Now, just understand, past results isn't necessarily an indication of future performance. Just because someone's been successful and has read market conditions correctly in the past doesn't mean that they know what's coming next. Right? Understand, Wall Street has been built on financial uncertainty, on people hiring financial advisors and stockbrokers to make decisions for them. Well, just understand the reason for the inflation. It's because governments, in an effort to keep your standard of living the same, have been printing a lot of money for the same amount of goods and services. Right? You print a lot of money, it's illusory. The person getting the money for a very short period of time feels like they have more money than they had before. So in the United States, we have stimulus packages and stuff like that. The problem is that Let's say before your neighborhood had X amount of assets and services. While they're printing the money, guess what? Your neighborhood still has X amount of goods and services. So the prices for those goods and services increase. Now in this environment, if you believe that we're headed for more inflation, your investment choices are going to be very different than if you thought deflation was coming. So in this environment, hard assets are king. Right? If there's a lot of inflation on the horizon, you want to invest in gold, in successful gold miners, in silver. Right? Let me just make a quick point here. Folks, gold and silver have been lagging the market. Understand, if you believe, if you know with certainty in your own mind that inflation is going to jump by 20% next year, 30%, if you feel we might enter an era of hyperinflation, then you can't believe your good luck right now having gold and silver prices where they are. Right? You also want to consider investing in physical real estate. Understand, they can't make new real estate. Right? Technically, that's not true. I could build a high-rise and, you know, have different floors and theoretically increase the number of places you could live in a neighborhood. Right? But you and I know, from a practical standpoint, they can't increase the amount of real estate. So if you have the money supply exploding, right? If the government, in an effort to maintain standards of living, in an effort to keep power, prints a lot of money, well, your limited supply 
hard asset, your limited supply real estate is going to jump in value. If you financed it at a fixed rate, in other words, they can't increase the rate on you, then you're making a boatload of money, right? Understand, if they can increase the interest rate on you, if it's adjustable and not fixed, well, as inflation increases, your rates are going to increase. How you structure the deal is everything. Also, in an inflationary environment, as you can imagine, limited supply good cryptocurrency, think Bitcoin, will go through the roof. Right? Whatever the money printers decide, there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin. Right? So every Bitcoin will be worth more and more dollars if they print more and more dollars. So understand, there's a whole group of people in places like Phoenix, in places like Idaho, in places like Texas right now, who are gobbling up all the real estate they can. Right? The idea is simply, hey, we're headed for inflationary times. If the folks are really clever, they're gobbling it up at fixed rates of debt. They're really making the money on the spread between inflation and the interest rate that they're paying. Well, what I want to do here in this video is talk about the crowd I belong to, the deflationists. I want people to study the last third of the 19th century right understand the argument for deflation and I want people to research two of the major deflationists who you can find online Dr. Lacey Hunt and Stephen Van Meter right in my Dwyer Markets playlist here online I have videos from both men I know deflation, especially when you're at the gas pump and the gas has actually increased in price, not decreased. You're at the supermarket and that beef ribeye has increased in price, not decreased. I understand that right now the deflationist crowd is viewed as crazy, right? Call me crazy. But understand, you only get hyperinflation when you have monetary velocity right it's when they give me extra money and then I turn around and I spend that money and then the person who gets the money whether it's the grocer whether it's the gas station attendant will will pretend that gas station attendants still exist right uh, whether it's the barber whether it's a plumber that person then turns around and spends the money. Right? Understand, people only spend the money when they feel they're getting a good deal. And when they have money coming in. They can spend the money they have now because they get more money to spend in the future. If people start getting insecure about the economy, then they start holding on to dollars. Right then they start making decisions on what to spend money on. So what I want people to realize is right now monetary velocity is not there. The financial media, CNBC, Bloomberg can say what they want, folks. The monetary velocity is not there. People are not giddy over the economy. The way they're acting, they're suspicious of it. They're viewing these stimulus infrastructure bills as future tax increases. Right? Understand what you have might be, this is what I believe, short term inflation. In other words, the federal government is going to have quantitative easing, they're going to print money. Right? The bills keep getting bigger and bigger. 
Understand, when they're talking about $3.5 trillion, this is a current dispute in the United States Congress, right? One group wants $3.5 trillion spent on infrastructure that isn't exactly spending on roads and airports. You're talking about a bill calling for more spending than the annual U.S. defense budget. Right? Well, what I believe is going to happen is after we realize that all the money printing has not increased the amount of goods and services, I believe you're going to get price reversals. So take China right now. And I told you China is big. If the Chinese property sector starts dropping in price, if the investors in China, many of them again, own two, three homes, lose faith in the future of the Chinese property sector, then understand property prices in China are going to drop. That's what deflation is all about. Understand, it's going to ripple through the economy. Other property investors who might be able to afford their property holdings are going to find that their net worths have dropped. Just like yours would. If you're a homeowner and the prices of homes in your area drops by 30%. You're going to have compression. In other words, in California, for example, right now, let's say the average price of a house in some areas is 12 times. 12 times the median income of people in those areas. In other words, you would have to spend every dollar that you make for 12 years to pay for your home. Right? And I'm just pulling numbers. I'm in San Jose. I'm just pulling numbers out of the ear here that apply to the local market here. Obviously, different locations in California have different price multiple points. Well, just imagine what happens if that compresses from 12 to 8 times your median income. Homeowners will have then lost four years net worth of their median income. If you're carrying a mortgage on the property, <clears throat> you might actually have lost all the equity in the property. Understand, that's going to have a profound effect on your spending pattern. Right before you were at the restaurant and you were thinking, hey, you know, waiter, I'll take, I'll take a nice ribeye. Uh, let's make it 16 ounces and uh, yeah I'll take a you know foreign IPA and yeah please come back with the dessert menu we'll also have some appetizers right that's when your home is worth 12 times your annual income if it drops to 8 and I suspect the drop might be more severe in China if it drops to 8 you might go into the restaurant and you might say, hey, waiter, skip the appetizer. No beef for me. Let me get chicken. Dessert menu, no thanks. Don't want it. Oh, I'll be drinking water. Right? You understand that's going to ripple across the economy. Understand, too. The economy is so debt enthused that you have companies right now issuing debt to buy back their own stock. What happens if our attitude toward debt changes? What happens if prospective investors look at the financials and say, I can't invest in this company. There's too much debt. Right? Prices are going to start to shrink. The P.E. ratio is going to start to shrink across the stock market. Investors as a group are going to lose wealth. 
there'll be a crowd out there shorting the market who know how to operate in a bear market. But you and I know there'll also be another crowd out there who are newbies to the market who might not be adept, who might lose a lot of the money they put into the market. Right? Let's face it, folks. Some well-known companies have gone bankrupt. Where is WorldCom today? Where is Enron today? Does anyone remember Washington Mutual Bank? Lehman. Right? So, understand, in a world of deflation, and I know this is counterintuitive, the investors who win might be the investors, if you could believe this, holding cash. The very fiat currency that Bitcoiners like myself scoff at. Right? The investors who win might be the investors who, of course, have bought bonds. This is Stephen Van Meter's thesis here. And he's right about it, in my opinion. You know, right now we laugh at the idea of getting a little bit more than 1% on a 20-year, right? If you're in a deflationary environment, some of your friends down the road might say, wow, you're actually getting a rate of return on your bond, right? Understand, if you're getting a rate of return and debt markets... <laughs> collapse and the bond issuer is obligated and we're only talking about sovereign debt here right because in that environment corporate debt might be too risky to hold right because the corporation's existence might be under pressure right if some respected at least for now group like the uh, United States government has lent, you know, you have lent them money and they're paying you a certain interest rate and they have a certain perceived credit worthiness, right? The people around you might not be able to get the interest rate you're receiving in a deflationary environment. So the people buying sovereign debt might actually be the ones making money. In other words, understand, an entirely different group than the group that would win in an inflationary environment. Let me also say too that in a deflationary environment understand the debtors are really under pressure because the value of the dollar is going up that makes their loan paybacks, the cost of their loan paybacks, go up. So a lot of people are going to be forced into bankruptcy. And what you'll find down at the courthouse will be a bunch of sophisticated investors prepared to talk to the bankruptcy trustee about buying some of the bankrupt estate for pennies on the dollar. So what I want people to do here, particularly young people, is to outperform your environment. In other words, the people I've mentioned here, Michael Burry, Dr. Lacey Hunt, Stephen Van Meter, they're all online. You can look them up on YouTube. You can do your own research. I'm a big believer in doing your own research. Right? Don't get caught up on labels uh, in terms of people saying, oh, you're a contrarian. Right? Look, what you want to be is an informed investor. In other words, don't worry about being contrarian or whatever. What you want to worry about is knowing the facts. Thinking about your own experience. Recognizing that even very successful, very successful investors could predict the future inaccurately, that the future necessarily involves risk and uncertainty. 
that there are a lot of situations like Evergrande globally that could explode at any moment. Right? What you want to do is you want to learn how to read finance statements. You want to figure out the debt, right? You visit a friend, they live in Newport Beach or wherever, uh, on the water, Marina Del Rey. Um, you're thinking to yourself, wow, my boy is bowling here. Then you find out that it's all debt financed. You visit another friend, he's living humbly. He might have a view of the water, but his place is not as, as big as the debtor friend you had. Then you find out it's all paid for. In other words, he or she is living in real time. You want to redefine what you consider a baller to be. You want to figure out if you think inflation is coming or if you think deflation is coming. Whether you think China's real estate situation is sustainable at current levels or whether there are going to be changes. Which direction the changes are going to be in. How can you profit? What are the chances that the contagion might spread worldwide? You want to be hedged. In other words, let's say you're looking at the world and you're thinking, wow, you know, there is a good chance that there's inflation. So maybe I need to get some gold. You also need to think about, well, what about the chances that there's deflation? Because monetary velocity simply is not there. Because I'm talking to my friends and I'm finding out that none of them can afford a home. Or I'm finding out that the friends who are affording a home are suffering a high opportunity cost where most of their money is going into the home they don't even have money left over to invest in groundbreaking huge upside technologies like Bitcoin. Right? You need to think for yourself. But just understand, if you take one thing away from this video, and I hope you replay it, and feel free to leave comments for me in the comment section of this YouTube video. But the one thing I want you to take away from this video is that markets are global. Right? I laugh when I hear people say, oh, Evergrande is contained. Right? Understand, we're now in the internet age. Investors can hop online even if their money is not in China. They see the real estate market collapsing in China. And they'll then go around and they'll say, well, wow, what other overpriced property markets are there in the world? Right? They'll be thinking to themselves, what are the chances that this will reach my property market? Even if it doesn't, what are the chances that I'm dealing with concentrated markets, centralized markets, where the number of players aren't that diverse? And if they lose confidence in what's a Ponzi scheme, China could quickly crumble. And that could have devastating effects on not just property, but other markets that China is in. Right? Let's be clear on it all. So, not surprisingly, an indebted the United States is reconsidering its relationship with China. Understand, I believe Joe Biden and President Xi are going to have to get together and they're going to have to normalize trade relationships. Make it a win-win. Give Chinese capital and give American capital access to the Chinese market and the American market. We need to get back to free trade. This is my little editorial contribution in this video. We need to get back to free trade because quite frankly, both China and the United States right now are suffering greatly 
with low monetary velocity. Printing money, in my opinion, is not the answer. That's how I see it. Figure out which side you're on. Figure out that the copper market, the steel market, both have less demand than they did before with Chinese builders having problems paying their bills. If you're going to follow one market, don't make it the stock market, make it the bond market. Right? In our current world, the price of debt could be the most significant piece of data. You have to ask yourself why governments are resorting to quantitative easing. You have to ask yourself what the price of debt would be if the market was allowed to have price discovery. Right? Given all the risks in China right now, given all the risks in the United States, I'm sure we all realize that without interest rate suppression, without government gimmicks like quantitative easing, interest rates would be a lot higher. Finally, you need to ask yourself, how much longer will governments and central banks be able to control the interest rates because folks sooner or later the market takes over that's how I see it let me hear from you I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video thanks for stopping by